Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight. We honor you, we bless you, we praise you for your incredible goodness unto us, the children of men. Thank you for your loving kindness, your tender mercies. Thank you for your love wherein you loved us. You sing over us with joy. You are delighted in us. We are the apple of your eyes. We bless your name. Thank you so much for another day. Thank you for the gathering of your people on together unto your name. We thank you for a time of refreshing from your presence tonight. Thank you, Lord God, as you break open the seals of your word. Thank you for change that will take place in our lives. Thank you that we're going to grow up in you to the glory of your name. Lord, we honor you tonight. We bless your name. Thank you for our time together. Holy Spirit, you are most welcome. Thank you, Lord God. We bless you. We honor you tonight. In Jesus' name, we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Please, Ajay. Amen. Ah, well, so welcome to day number one of these teachings from the book of Galatians. Uh, as we study the justification by grace through faith. Uh, just so you know, this is going to be a marathon, not a sprint. And by that I mean we're going to take it little by little, precept upon precept. And uh, so just bear with me because particularly tonight as a foundational uh, teaching, uh, what I'm going to address tonight, it becomes the groundwork upon which everything else will be built. So I'm going to try to take my time. Amen? Praise God. All right. Please, if you have your Bibles and the media, if you go with me to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. I'm going to read from verses 1 through 14. In the outset, I don't know about you guys, but I'm still bubbling from yesterday. Uh, I really just thank God for the grace upon Dr. I.J. and Nancy and the message they brought to us, the encouragement, the whole nine yards. It was absolutely refreshing. Amen? Amen. Okay, Galatians chapter 1, verse 1, NKJV, please, ma'am. Amen. All right, here we go. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. And all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our, of our, of our God and Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> Verse 6. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. For, I do, for do I now persuade man or God? Or do I seek to please man? For as, if I still pleased man, I would not be a born servant of Christ. But if I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man, for I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it. But it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, 
being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my father. So tonight I just want to establish Paul's apostolic authority. Now this is important because if we fail to really authenticate his apostolic authority, then the rest of the message he's bringing will not have the, uh, we, we will not be able to properly not only just receive it, but really be grounded on it. This is very, very critical. Now, the reason this is critical is because, first of all, let me even back up. This book or letter to the Galatians is the very first New Testament letter or book. Did you hear that? The book of Galatians precedes Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The very first book. This book was written around 48 or 49 AD. That is barely 15 years after the ascension of Christ. Okay? So more than likely, some of the people in this Galatian church actually saw the ministry of Jesus. You must understand the context. Because sometimes when we miss or don't understand the context, we do not know how to apply the truth that is contained therein. Amen? Now, in this writing in particular, when you read all of the Pauline epistles, there has been no stronger language of rebuke used than the one that's used in the book of Galatians. Right off the bat. But there's a reason for that. And that's why I'm taking it slowly, carefully, building upon this issue of his apostolic authority. There were three issues that Paul needed to address with this church. Now, you need to understand this is not just one church. There are a bunch of churches in the Galatian area, which is really Antioch, which is modern day Syria. Amen? So there were a few issues that prompted the writing of this letter or this book of Galatians. Number one among the issues was the fact that the uh, certain brethren, actually Paul calls them false brethren, men from Judea, who Bible scholars call Judaizers, J-U-D-A-I-Z-E-R, Judaizers, these false brethren came into the church and began to spread news among the church. Now, these are the churches that Paul started. So he's gone. You know, Paul is traveling all over, all over the place. He's here today. He's gone tomorrow. Here today. Gone tomorrow. So while he was gone, they came back in and said, listen, this Paul that's preaching this message. Are, are you guys sure about this Paul? Are you guys, do you guys really, do you guys, are you guys certain of his, the validity of his authority to bring a message he's bringing to you guys? So the first thing the challenge was his apostolic credentials. And there's a reason they did that. We're going to get to that in a minute. The second issue that was a problem in the Galatian church was the message that they were preaching or ministering. Now, Paul had previously gone there and preached a message of Jesus only. Jesus being the complete package of God, faith in Jesus only plus nothing. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is our King. Jesus is our Lord. Jesus alone is it. That was the message that they cut their teeth on. The message of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. Now, these false brethren came in behind Paul and said, you know what? Yeah, we agree that Jesus is Lord and Jesus is the Messiah and Jesus is the, is the way. However, with your Jesus had a little work. In fact, in Acts 15 verse 1, they said, no one can be saved except you accept Jesus plus circumcision. Are you guys following me? Wow, are you guys really happy? I mean, you guys, the way you guys are looking at me. Ah, oh, are you sure? Yes. Okay, every now and then to see your head move or hear your amen is very encouraging. Amen? 
So number one, their challenge is, they challenge this apostolic authority. Number two, they challenge the message he brought. And number three, they said, you know what, Paul? You are perverting the gospel message because you are trying to appease the Gentiles. You are trying to win favor with the Gentiles and that's why you are diluting the message. Three things. So Paul heard that. Woo! He had righteous indignation. And he came running back and said, you guys, let's establish start, start some things. So, so tonight, my goal, my ultimate goal in this series of teachings, number one, to instruct you. By instruction, I mean to help you see what God sees. Number two, to inspire you. What does that mean? To help you feel what God is feeling. And number three, to ignite you or to involve you. To help to get you to act. That's what I mean by that. So three things, to instruct, to inspire, and to ignite. To help, help you think the way God is thinking, instruct. To inspire you, to help you feel the way God feels. And to ignite, to help, to get you to act. The ultimate goal of our time together all week is to motivate you to massive, immediate action. Not tomorrow, immediate. Massive, immediate action in order to create real and lasting change in all of your lives. Not, not an amen on that one? <laughs> you guys don't want to change? <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, tomorrow night I have some pizza for everybody when you come. <laughs> so now, so, so, so now, in this message, in Paul's corrective message to the Galatian church, he understood that the message must not only be power punched, but that the message must have some credibility. Because now something is happening in the church that he knows should not be happening. People that are in the public speaking will tell you there are three pillars in persuasive public speaking. Three pillars. Number one, ethos. It's a Greek word that simply means life, the life of the messenger. The meth ethos must be in place. Number two, there must be logos. Logos referring to the content or the message you bring in. And number three, there must be a pathos, pathos, P-A-T-H-O-S, pathos that corresponds along with the logos and the ethos. Pathos has to do with passion. So ethos has to do with the life of the messenger, logos, the content of the message they bring, and pathos, the passion of delivery. So tonight, I just want to address the ethos and the pathos of Paul's message to the Galatian church. It's important. This is why it's important. The Judaizers came to the church and attacked the credibility of who Paul was. And they did that to say, this guy is not worthy of you listening to him. Now, let, let me just back up. What will happen as we're preparing to receive Dr. Aji and Nancy, if I told you on Sunday morning, two, three Sundays ago, and said, Dr. Aji and Nancy is coming. Now, you know, you guys know this is not true, but I'm just giving you a fictitious situation. And I said to you, Dr. Aji is, is drunk 23 hours out of 24 hours a day. He abuses his wife and physically abuses his children. He cannot be trusted. Now, if I sat there and put that kind of picture, and I said, now, it'd be good for you guys to come and hear him on Sunday. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm trying to say? When you destroy the messenger, the message is in jeopardy. So these Judaizers came out attacking Paul's credibility and the validity of his call and they were doing so, so that in doing that, they can destroy the message. And that's why the language that Paul used and the things he said are the strongest of all his Pauline writings. So now let's dive into the message. Back to Galatians chapter uh, 1 verse 1. Paul, an apostle not from man, nor through man. 
I mean, who, who writes a letter like that? Verse 1, jump out. Listen, I want you to know I am an apostle not from men and not through man. Very loaded. So let's just take a deep breath and go back and begin to look at this guy's profile. First of all, he was not a part of the original 12. And he was not a part of those who received the original great commission as we heard yesterday in Matthew chapter 28 and Mark chapter 16. So those guys knew that. So they said, you're not among the original 12. Who are you? You ain't got nothing to tell us. You bring a message, we can bring another, we can bring another message. Amen? Those original apostles of the Lamb received a direct call from Jesus and their baptism in the Holy Spirit was a matter of supernatural public evidence. From the upper room, they flowed out into the streets, 3,000 people were born again, and everybody knew something supernatural happened in Jerusalem. It was a matter of public notice. Paul, on the other hand, was relatively unknown in Jerusalem. He was first mentioned in Acts chapter 7, verse 58. Let's go there, please. And it was not a good mention. Acts 7, 58. And they cast him out of the city, Philip, and stoned him. And the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. This is the first mention of this man's name in the entire scriptures. And it was not for something wonderful. Amen? Acts chapter 8 verse 1. Acts 8 1. Going on on his profile here. Now Saul was consenting to his death. So we know he was not just standing by. He was really, really actively involved. With, this guy needs to die. Now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was of Je at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered through the regions of Judea, Samaria, and except the apostles. Verse 3. Acts 8, 3. As for Saul, he what? He made havoc of the church. Entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Let's hear from him what he said about himself in verse 12. 1 Timothy 1, 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful putting me into the ministry. Next verse. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man. Now this is Paul speaking now. This is the way he's describing himself. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Verse 14. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. I've said this before and I'm going to say this now. This is, this is a good place to say this. You, you want to know if you're really working in grace? You'll be willing to be openly vulnerable and talk about what, what your life before and your life after. All this grace talk is just what? Talk. Because I've not seen anybody yet say, Pastor, I need, to, I need to share a testimony. I need to share something. What are you going to share? Man, I used to be X, Y, Z. But by the grace of God, I'm delivered from it. I'm now, I stand in Christ. Hello. Hi. Nobody asked Paul. He said, let me tell you where I came from. Let me share with you where Jesus brought me from. I was a blasphemer, insolent man. My job, my, my former profession was to destroy the church. Did that diminish this man? So what are you hiding? 
Because until you come out, you keep that darkness and the enemy says, I, I still have a landing spot. Yeah. Yes. The, listen, you can, you can put on the facade, get up here, raise up your hands and dance and jump and skip and all of those of them say, yeah, keep on dancing. I'll catch you when you get out of the door. Why? Because the seed is there. The seed is there. This is the reason this is so important for us. We need to understand how to operate in the community. Yeah. Because my deliverance and your deliverance is mutually tied together in Christ as a, as a, mom, as a member of the same family. Yeah. But the enemy would like for us to hide and play deceit. Okay. So we've seen what Paul is all about. So now in Acts chapter 9, in verses 4 through 6, Acts chapter 9, verses 4 through 6, now so Paul now we know is on a destruction mission. And you will see the reason why all of this is important later on. You will see why it's important, that you understand and really fully come into the knowledge of this guy's background, you understand. Then, so this is on his, on his way to Damascus. He's received letters and authority to go and arrest Christians and put them in jail. Verse 4, then he fell to the ground because Jesus has come and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? See, this blasphemer, this insolent man, who you and I will have completely written off and saying it's unworthy and unqualified for the grace and mercy of God. Hello? You know how some people come, you know so you have some family friends or, or some family members who are not just quite like you? They're not as straight as you are? Or maybe they come to our church services? They're not as dressed as what we think, how a person that's a Christian should dress? And immediately we get into judgmental, critical spirit. Yeah. And we immediately write them off and say, you cannot receive because of God. You cannot receive the lessons of God. Mm. All of that stuff. Here is a man who is a murderer. And who is on his way on a mission to go and destroy more people. And Jesus confronts him head on. and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Notice how Jesus put himself with the body. Paul thought it was just attacking this man or that woman or that person. But Jesus said, what you did to one, you did to me. He made it and took it personal. So remember the next time you say something harsh to your wife or to your husband or to your children and you just think you're addressing them. Jesus said, what, what, why are you doing this to me? Why are you persecuting me? Next verse. And he said, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. In case you didn't hear me the first time. <laughs> all those letters you have, all those men and women you want to put in jail, actually it's me you are doing it to. And then Jesus reminded him, Paul, this exercise is an exercise in futility. Why? It is hard for you to kick against the bricks. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't want to start any, any problems here tonight. But can anybody tell me when Paul got saved? And I'm saying that, I'm challenging us because I'm saying to you, all of us must come to a place where we allow the Holy Spirit to be the Holy Spirit in the church and not me and you. Because right here in this exchange, as far as Jesus is concerned, this guy is done. Oh, I did not hear Paul say, I'm sorry for my insolence. I did not hear him say, my goodness, I am sorry for all those men and women I'm put in jail. 
None of that. Immediately he recognized who was speaking to him. None of that mattered. Lord, what would you have, what would you have me to do? Now, I'm bringing these points in. You will never fully comprehend why Paul is a champion of grace if you don't see his life. This is a man who has benefited from God's grace. He didn't read about it. He didn't watch it on a movie. He had a direct experience, a direct collision with God's grace. A man undeserving, a man unworthy, a man who was doing everything no Christian should ever do. And by the way, he didn't go looking for God. God came looking for him. Wow. Deal with that if you can. And, 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 and there's consistency and harmony in all scriptures about how God does these things. When Adam fell and he was hiding from God, who went to look for who? Adam, where are you? Is it that God is silent? He does not see. He does not know where he is. God's grace was extending to a man and saying, I know you feel unworthy, but let me, let me help you out here. Amen. Where are you? Amen. Let me build a bridge so you don't pack in your unworthiness. You don't pack in your damnation. Let me help you bring it into a light. Amen. And then we see Abel and Cain. Cain murdered Abel. Now the fall has taken place. Because theologians will tell us, well, God reached out to Adam because the, the fall had not taken place. Well, actually, he had fallen. Cain is killed Abel. Who made the first move? Did Cain go looking for God? No. God, again, consistent with his character, consistent with his nature, consistent with his essence as love. When and such Cain at Cain, Abba, where is your brother? And the guy replied, Am I my brother's keeper? Ha! <laughs> so, let's, let's read on. Let's get back to Paul here. Give me verse 15. Acts 9 15. But the Lord said to him, Oh, no, no, that's, that's too far. Okay, let, 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 me, let, me, let me give you something else. So now in Acts chapter 9 verse 10. Acts 9, 10. Here we go. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in the vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. <laughs> so... <laughs> So the Lord said to him, arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for the one called Saul. Now, notice, no, look, the, are you seeing this specific instruction? So you and I think something's happened to us and God does not know about it? He knows your house, the color of it, the color of your carpet. He, he, he knew what you ate for breakfast this morning. Nothing! It, doesn't, it does not miss anything out. So he gives, us, he gives Ananias specific direction where to find Saul. Arise, go and find him in the street called Straight. Inquire of the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he's praying. Verse 13. Then Ananias answered, Lord, you didn't get the memo? Jesus, you've not gotten the memo about this guy? I've heard from many about this man how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. In other words, God, you need to reconsider this choice. The man you are asking to go talk to is not worthy. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Did God change his mind? Are you sure? 
But the Lord said to him, go. That's what we heard on Sunday. The first two letters of the word God. Go. For it's a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. Ananias, but, but God, you didn't consult me. When did you choose him? <laughs> for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Now, let's back up. Galatians 1.1 1, 1 again. Paul said he did not get his authority or his apostleship from men nor by or through man. Two things. The first time, plural, men. The second time, singular, man. So he, when he said he did not get it from men, he's talking about the ultimate source of his authority. It is not man given. I did not go to Bible college, graduate, and as a result of my good performance in Bible school, I have now been conferred the authority of apostleship. No. Not so. Then he went on to say, it did not come by man. So the first point, it describes the source of his authority. By man, is describing the agency through which that authority came. Do you, guys, do you guys understand that? Okay, for most of us, we did not receive our call from man, but definitely ordained through man. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, we see the contrast in the scriptures in Acts chapter 1 verse 26 with Matthias. After Judas fell, those apostles came together and said, Jesus, Judas is gone. Let's do something. Let's replace him. The cast lots came on Matthias and they said, Matthias, you take Judas' place. That was the last time Matthias' name is ever mentioned. That the equivalency of ordination by online program. find a website and there are many of them you send hundred dollars to some place in Missouri they send you a license they say you're ordained they never met you they never know you they don't know nothing about your character you are laying hands suddenly on no man be careful there are some among us whom some among us have already ordained <laughs> there are some among us Pastor Bigger, you know what I'm talking about? There are some among us who have not paid the price, have not validated their calling. They have some anointing, they have a charisma, and we just like them because they shared a testimony, because they, we had a platform for them to share a story, and people start calling them pastors. He said, I'm an apostle. Not from men, nor by man. Let me tell you what my pedigree is. Now, the amazing thing about all of this is, you must recognize, like I said at the beginning, the book of Galatians is the first book that's written. So all the corroboration we now get in the book of Acts came later. I don't think you guys heard what I just said. The account of Paul's encounter on the road to Damascus, how God called him, and all of this, he came later. But even though he came later, he backed up everything the man was saying. Backed up everything. So, now, when Ananias went and laid hands on Paul, and he received his sight, I won't go to the scripture here, but in Acts, 29, Acts chapter 9, verses 26 and 28, the Bible said, when Paul went to Jerusalem, all the disciples said, no, 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 no. This guy is not real. This is fake. 
this guy is not born again for sure is here to do more damage now this is a first encounter except for the intervention of Barnabas who now took him and said yeah I hear you your concerns are legitimate but I'm telling you change has taken place ah, yeah, 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 yeah. a lot can be said about the issue of credibility for all of us. If Barnabas did not have credibility, we would not have the writings of Paul today. I cannot tell you how critically important it is, especially for what we do, when you go to places, travel abroad, that the way you enter the place, the nation, is absolutely important. Who you enter by, you better make sure they have what we call metron. Metron mean the, the parameters of authority conferred upon that minister or an individual, otherwise you perish. I'm looking at time here. But when first went to Thailand, the first minister we tried to work, it didn't work. Good man, good ministry, but they did not have a metron for Thailand. So we had to disconnect ourselves from that relationship as hard as it was. And we knew that God was still speaking, You've, you need to be here, you need to do this work here. So when we went back, after much prayer and deliberation and reflection, we went back. We only had one, inform one piece of information. Ah, no, no, God is too much, honestly. I I'm just thinking back now, it's, it's incredible. We only had... A name, Brent uh, Pennington, and the school, elementary school that the guy was running, and we got on the airplane and we went. Myself, my wife, Sammy Badaki, and Faith. We got there, I talked to the guy, and, you know, we're here, we want to be a blessing. Bless. Uh, all the things he needed were not the things we can meet. The needs he had. He wanted also to help them get missionaries that would come there and teach in the school. Well, that's not what I'm called to do. And then we talked and talked and talked. Very nice guy. And I finally said, you know what? Let's do something. And he, uh, he sat us in the, in the room and was bringing in his school teachers one at a time to have a chat and fellowship with us. The first one came, nothing happened. Cordial, nice conversation. Nothing. There was nothing there. Second one came, nothing there. Third one came, nothing there. And then, he said, well, I have one more. And then he brought him Nancy. Do you remember that day? And then we started talking. And then from that conversation, something was ignited. We knew there, there was something here. And that's the journey we've been for the last eight years. But I'm saying that to say the level of authority that they walked in, that God had conferred upon them, we came in and enjoyed that authority because they already established with credibility. That's what happens. Even Nigeria. Back in the day, Nigeria, the same thing. My brother knew the guy. I didn't know him. Brought me in. We spent 15 minutes praying and the rest is history. Now, this is the key. I'm consciously aware till this day that except God did that, I'll still be nobody in the back side of the desert somewhere. I, 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 I can never forget that. It's a God thing, not a man thing. So Barnabas, as a father figure, saw the potential in Paul and said, I'm going to take you up. I'm going to take you around. And if I can just give you stability, the grace of God in time will speak for itself. Because a man's gift will always make room for them. I'm bringing them before kings. So Barnabas was the one that made the way or paved the way for Paul's ministry. Now, let's talk about Paul for a minute. We've, I've talked about how 
a disaster it was and the things he did, the damages he did and all that, all that stuff. Why did Jesus use this man? Why not Peter? Of course, he used Peter, but not in this way. Because we know that Apostle Paul wrote two thirds of the entire New Testament. Can you imagine a blasphemer, insolent man? A persecutor, the guy that was destroying the church, ultimately became the defender of the church. So Jesus said to us in John chapter 14, in verse 12, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, no, he who believes in me shall do the works that I do. And greater works than this shall they do. Is that what Jesus promised? We've tried to figure it out. What does that mean? Are you going to raise more dead than Jesus? Are you going to heal more cancer than Jesus? Are you going to... Just say, listen. Very liberal, I say unto you. Whoever believes in me, the works that I do, shall he do. And greater works than this shall he do what? Because I go to my father. I told you last week that the issue of works, Jesus answered in John chapter 6, works, it simply means believing on who who he has sent. So Jesus is saying here, a time is coming when I'm going to be with my father. And those of us who believe in me, you're going to have such revelation, you're going to, you're going to blow your mind. Watch this. John chapter 16 verse 12. Jesus said to his, those, those disciples, he said, I have many more things to say to you. He said, but you are not able to bear it. And I put that in context. Go back to John chapter 3. Nicodemus coming to Jesus. And Jesus says, you must be born again. Nicodemus says, really? Born again? I'm a grown man. Are you suggesting that I have re-entered my mother's womb to be born again? What, what kind of a talk is this? Oh, Jesus said, he that is born of the flesh is flesh. And he that is born of the spirit is spirit. Now, please help me. How much more clearer did Jesus get by that answer? He made it worse. This guy is trying to answer, how can I be born again? And Jesus is telling him, he that is born of the spirit is the spirit. He said, excuse me. But Jesus did not answer that question directly because it would have done Nicodemus no good. He had not gone to the grave yet. He had not been buried. He had not risen from the dead. No one could be born again at that time. And therefore, there was no need for him to tell him how to be born again. The will has not been executed. Hebrews chapter 9. There must be the death of his testator before the will can be in effect. So Jesus did not answer the question. Now the point I'm making is this. How do we know how to be born again? How? How do we know that today? You better thank God for this insolent man. Because in Romans 10, 9, he broke it down for us. If you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Nicodemus, can you hear that? That's the answer to your question, which Jesus did not answer. But now Jesus is giving the ability to answer the question to Paul. So when Paul said it, Jesus was speaking through Paul by extension. Huge. Now, I'm laying the foundation because this is important. Because this guy is going to say so many things to us, we're going to scratch our head and say, wait a minute, no, 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 no. no. But we need to understand. Paul did not preach a different gospel. Jesus came gave us through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four Gospels, as we will. But the four Gospels, according to what Paul said in Colossians 1.25, was not complete. <sighs> Give me Colossians chapter 1, verse 25. Shade, can you hear me? Colossians 1.25. Oh, is there? Ah, thank you. Do you guys have the NET translation here? Yeah. 
or ERV? <laughs> you don't have either. Uh, you have NLT. What does? Give it that. Let me see what NLT says. Ah, this is better, but not quite complete. But this, this is good. God has given me the responsibility of serving His church by proclaiming what His entire message. NET, ERV says the complete message. What am I saying? No, Paul is not giving us a different message. He's, he's completing what Jesus started to say. For which Jesus said, there is more things I need to say to you, but you are not able to bear it. You are you are bound to the earth. You are stuck in the earth. You, you do not have the capacity, or as we say today, the bandwidth. To receive what I can add to you until the coming of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit now, acting in my stead, will download to you those things on as need basis. That's what Paul has. Are you following what I'm saying? Ah, yes, oh, man, time is. Wow, 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 wow. Let's go to Galatians 1, 11, 12 for a minute. It, it, it's, it's so important to understand these things because if you don't understand these things, you, 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 your, your understanding of scripture is going to be limited. What am I, what am I saying about these things? Jesus' ministry, you must understand when it happened. <laughs> okay, give me Galatians 4 4 first and back to NKJV. I'm still trying to establish Paul's credibility here and then we're going to move on. When the fullness of the time was come, God sent for his son, born of a woman. When was he born? Only three people saw that? How about the rest of you guys? Did you, did you say that? Yes. Under the law. What I'm saying to us is, Jesus' ministry was under the law. If you don't understand that, you're going to keep on having clashes. You're going to think scripture contradicts itself. And that's not true. There were certain things he could not do in that era because what? The, it was the dispensation of the law. Yeah. Now, all through his life, he gave us snapshots or nuggets or a little, we, we saw glimpses, that's a better word, glimpses of grace. But primarily, his entire ministry was under the law. He was born under the law. Because if he did not fulfill the law, he would have been disqualified from going to the cross. You must understand that. Yeah. I was at a Bible study in Yangon. And uh, before they brought me up to speak, the leader of the group was praying. <laughs> my brother is laughing already, says my wife. Now, going up there, I was struggling. God, what am I going to say to these guys? What do you want me to say? I got nothing. I said, got there and sat down. So the guy said, I pray. Okay, that's good. I can flow with that. And then just before he closed the prayer, he said, now, now, I want all of you guys now to take note and just ask for forgiveness of all of your sins because you must understand God will not bless us here tonight if you, if, you know, if, if, if you, well, yes, he said, he said that. So I said to myself, oh, wow, now. I see where I'm going with this. Now, I understand what he's saying. Because he quoted Jesus. Which said, if you don't forgive people, then your father in heaven will not forgive you. So I understand that. But what he did not understand yeah. is that Paul came and gave us the complete message. What's the complete message? 
Ephesians 1 7 that we have forgiveness by and through what? The shedding of blood. Under the law, I had to forgive to receive forgiveness. That was the law. But in this dispensation, forgiveness is needful, is necessary, is you need to forgive, but you are not forgiving for the same reason as under the law. Under the law, it was contingent that you forgave in order to be forgiven. But according to Paul, you forgive because you've been forgiven. Huge difference. Huge difference. Huge difference. And the truth of the matter is, when we really ex examine scriptures, it's so clear. Because all of those miracles he just did in his earthly ministries, did he go about asking people, have you forgiven somebody? Now, I need to open your eyes, but uh, did you forgive your, your, forgive your wife, your father, your sister? He didn't ask that question. None of that. Are you telling me that none of those guys had any issues that they needed to address? But that did not matter to Jesus. But because they carried something in him that's beyond the law. Now, I'm saying this because you need to understand where Paul is coming from. Because if you don't understand that, you're going to get in a lot of trouble. A pastor friend of mine was preaching in Maryland and he, he got on this issue. And the host pastor jumped up. Ha! Ah, that's why I don't like you guys. You are telling me that the words of Paul is greater than the words of, words of Jesus? It became a big argument in the church. Yeah. No, the words of Paul, absolutely not. They are not greater than Jesus. No. Whatever Paul said, he said an extension based on the revelation of the Holy Spirit now. Jesus having told them, I have much more to say to you, you are not able to bear it. They say, leave me to what I can share with you right now. But when I go to my father, through the spirit, I give you the full revelation. That's the point. So, oh, you found an NIT, NET. Praise God. Let's read it. I became the someone of the church according to the stewardship from God given to me for you. Did you see that? Given to me for you. In order to complete the word of God. Which was started by Jesus. Thank you. You don't have this, it's not complete. In fact, Paul was so bold in Romans, uh, one of those Romans, so he said, my gospel. He calls this message, my gospel. Car, that is boldness. Now, a day came, <laughs> I'm almost done now. A day came when Paul's ministry and his credibility, credibility was fully established. Acts 19. Let's go there. Acts 19 verses 13 through 17. Acts 19. Verses 13 through 17. Acts of the Apostles. <laughs> Chapter 19. Thank you. Finally, brethren, is here. <laughs> then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also, there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. Ah, what happened? And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know. And Paul I know. Wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Even evil spirit at this point now. I've come not only to acknowledge that Jesus exists and he has power. Now, the evil spirits are now saying, Jesus I know. Paul I know. And who in the hell are you? <laughs> That's huge. That's huge. Because in Mark 
chapter 3, Jesus is preaching, teaching the Pharisees, and these guys, they could not recognize Jesus for being the son of God. But the evil spirit said, you son of God, have you come to torment us before our time? Why the religious folks were still grappling with who Jesus was, evil spirits knew him. And now we see evil spirits knowing Paul. So my question to you tonight is, does hell know you? Are you known in hell? I'm serious. It's a serious question. Because you would never be a threat to the enemy until you recognize the authority you carry. So the day came when Paul's credibility was established. Wow. Let me just fast forward here and just get out of here. Uh, going back to Galatians chapter 1. Now the reason I'm taking the time to do this is because if we don't establish his authority, we will not fully establish his message. Okay? Galatians chapter 1 verse 18. So then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him for 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Okay? So the point here Paul is making is, Jesus saved him, filled him with the Holy Spirit, called him to a mission and Paul did not have to confer with anybody. And for three years was out there doing the work. After three years, he said, you know what, let me just go check in. Make sure these things I'm teaching and preaching is valid. Went to Jerusalem, met with Peter and James only and stayed 15 days and then left them again. And I was not back in Jerusalem for 14 years later. 14 years later. So I've given you a sketch of his profile. Now in the last two, three minutes, let me just tell you about his passion. Because those two things are important. First, it establishes the credibility of who he is and how he got there. Now we see from verse, Galatians chapter 1 verse uh, 6. It says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you grace of God to a different gospel. In fact, in chapter 3, I believe it is, he said, who has bewitched you? Chapter 3, verse 1. Oh, foolish Galatians. How would you guys take it when you come on Sunday morning and say, oh, foolish work for us. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I won't do that. But Paul did. And the reason he did that is because of the passion of what was happening in the church. He realized that the church came this close to becoming an ethnic cultural center. These Judaizers almost hijacked this fledgling small church with the perversion of their message. They were saying, Jesus is not alone. You must become Jewish to become a Christian. That's the essence of what they were saying. So if you're ever going to be a Christian, you have to be a Jew first. And Paul said, no, 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 no. Like we heard yesterday, no, 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 no. <laughs> Absolutely not. And so he used very strong language, very rigorous defense. And in chapters 2 through 6 de uh, develops all of that. But you need to understand where it's coming from. He saw the church been ext going to extinction if he didn't address it. So, what does this say to me and you as we close tonight? Number one, we must be men and women of credibility. No one on your job, in your businesses, at home, at school is going to listen to you if you're living like, living like a fool. They're not, they're not going to listen. You can quote 19 scriptures, dance on your head, put headphones on all day long, they're watching you. We are living, written epistles, read by our, our men. Paul had to bring something to the table. 
And it was not afraid to say, I used to be like this, but now I'm changed. Credibility. Secondly, in a time in which you and I are living in, there's all kinds of cultural, societal issues that we're dealing with. The Bible says, contend for the faith, faith once delivered unto you. That's what Paul did. You know what the true message was? He saw a perversion of that message. He just didn't stand idly by. He contended for it. And as you're going to see tomorrow, not only did they contend for it, he called out a great apostle by name and challenged him publicly. He said, this is wrong. So you and I cannot keep on going around, seeing the evil and the wrong things around us, and just say, well, it doesn't concern me, I'll just move on. You do that, God will not be able to trust you with more of his riches. When I say riches, I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about true riches of the kingdom. Amen? Let's pray. We're in two minutes of our time. Credibility. Do you goof up? At, are, you, are you a goofball at work? Are you the clown on your job? Do you take excessive break times? Are you argumentative? You fighting everyone? They see you coming, they run away. We can't use the excuse that ah, oh, they are unbelievers. No, no. Luke 15 verse 1 says, even sinners were drawn to Jesus. Yes. Sinners were drawn to him. Let's ask God to help us tonight. And in the succeeding days, you're going to find out how to walk in the spirit so that these things can begin to fall off of you. And then we need to ask for boldness. Boldness in the sense that we should not see evil and continue to just play with it. We should be able to speak the truth in love. Honey, I really love you. You're doing a great job, but you know what? You need to know this thing is not right. Yeah. Yeah. Father, we thank you for the power and the presence of your spirit tonight. You know where we are here. Uh, you know the areas where we need to make adjustments. Holy Spirit, you are the administrator of God's grace. We call on you tonight. Deal with our hearts. Blow the whistle on those areas that you want to work on. Give us ears to hear and hearts to heed. So that we can become the ambassadors that you are calling us to be. So we can manifest the hope of our calling wherever we are. Thank you, Father God. You said that the, bold, the righteous are as bold as a lion. That's what you said. And so tonight, Lord God, we are thanking you for boldness. That we'll learn how to speak the truth in love. Not out of vindictiveness or judgmental critical spirit. So that we can become your instruments of bringing people to repentance. Help us to begin to demonstrate that fruit of your spirit, that goodness. Because it's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. Father, we thank you tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen. So that's the profile of Paul. That's his, that's his authority. Now, we, from tomorrow night, we're going to start seeing how he used the authority in the logos or the message he carried. Amen? Amen? God bless you. Thank you so much for coming. We'll see you tomorrow night. And I uh, may or may not have pizza for you tomorrow night. <laughs>